Sup, Chooms? Hope everything is Nova with y'all. Sorry the uploads have been a bit slow as of late, but rest assured, we've got some preem content coming this week to cover as we continue our righteous crusade against the Slaphead Curse. So, when it comes to finding resources on fighting hair loss on the internet, we sadly don't have a lot of good options. We have a bunch of heavily marketed snake oils, like we have Hair Guard, Revivogen, Nioxin, amongst many others, and we also have an unfathomable amount of fear monger about finasteride, even though it is indeed an FDA-approved treatment, which is clinically proven to be both safe and effective for the overwhelming majority of people. Now, of course, there is no such thing as a drug that is going to be completely free of detractors, no matter how good its safety or efficacy profile is, but what is especially sad about finasteride is that most of the fear-mongering about this drug comes from forums and subreddits, which are ironically intended to help people with hair loss. So, rather than provide encouragement to people People to try these two FDA-approved treatments like finasteride minoxidil, which are of course backed by the most clinical research, they will instead do everything they possibly can to spread fear and misinformation about these drugs by misinterpreting research and assuming that everything bad happening to them must be because of finasteride. And what makes it especially stupid and frustrating is that these hair loss forums will also at the same time enthusiastically encourage people to use unproven and potentially dangerous treatments such as abandoned research chemicals like RU5841 or last resort blood pressure medications like oral minoxidil, yet ironically at the same time they'll do everything they can to discourage people from using an actual FDA approved treatment like finasteride that has literally hundreds of millions of dollars of research confirming both its safety and efficacy. So whenever someone is starting to lose their hair and seeking advice, the first thing I will do is I will always try to discourage them from viewing and engaging with any of the various hair loss forums or subreddits that plague the internet out there, uh, or anything that is dedicated to the subject of hair loss on the internet, period. I mean, all they will find there is a sad cesspool of losers who are trying to cope with their lack of courage to use finasteride by spreading as much fear and misinformation about it as possible, while at the same time crossing their fingers hoping for something better to to come along, you know, it's just around the corner, just wait a little bit longer. And you know, I know that sounds harsh, but you have to wonder, why is it that people who claim to get side effects are so determined to post what happens to them online? I mean, everybody already knows finasteride, like any drug, has a small risk of side effects, so why is it that everyone who gets or thinks they got side effects, side effects from finasteride, why is it that they're so adamant to post about it online? I mean, it's not like the people they're talking to on forums are qualified to diagnose and treat them, so why don't they just go to a, a doctor and discuss potential titration adjustments, for instance, rather than ask random people on hair loss forums about it. It's because they hate the fact that they can't use finasteride, so they want to give the impression that nobody can use it because it makes them feel more comfortable, which is really petty and spiteful if you think about it. And sadly, these horror stories are pretty much all you ever hear about uh, online regarding finasteride because, let's face it, the overwhelming majority of people who use finasteride will take it with no issues and they'll just get on with their lives. And these horror stories are the only reason finasteride gives such a horrible first impression to anyone who does research on it online, because all we hear about is the fear-mongering from idiots who conveniently scapegoat finasteride for all of their personal failings. You know... I'll tell you, much of my initial finasteride hesitancy came from reading these forums, which is ironic since it was forums dedicated to fighting hair loss that caused me to lose so much ground to begin with, since they convinced me that finasteride was causing me these problems, and I inevitably just ended up giving myself a nocebo effect. It wasn't until I did my own research and I learned how to properly interpret studies that I realized just how utterly full of shit most of these idiots online were, and also how full of shit I was for being dumb enough to believe them. So, a good example of this fear-mongering is the claim that finasteride increases the risk of high-grade prostate cancer. As usual, this fear is being propagated by the idiots from the hair loss forums and subreddits, and rather than try to disseminate the research, they just read a couple of lines from an abstract and then just jump to whatever conclusion they want to believe before posting their bullshit online. So, finasteride hate cults like the PFS Foundation, they honestly couldn't even hope to gaslight about finasteride as much as the hair loss forums do. So, since none of these morons from the hair loss forums have the critical thinking skills to properly interpret any of these studies they keep on posting, let me do them a favor and take a look at the supposed risk of finasteride causing high-grade prostate cancer. So anyways, over the years, 
There has obviously been a lot of confusion regarding finasteride's role in the development of prostate cancer because, you know, at one time it was even thought that it might be an effective treatment against prostate cancer since prostate cancer is, after all, an androgen-dependent disease. And we know that DHT is the androgen which is most present in the prostate, hence why it can cause an enlarged prostate. Finasteride was first FDA-approved to treat enlarged prostate way back in 1992, which was before the FDA approved it for hair loss in men, which I think was either 1996 or 1996. Seven, although the dose for treating a large prostate or benign prostatic, prostatic hyperplasia, BPH, is 5 milligrams rather than the 1 milligram, which is considered the standard dose for hair loss. So being that Proscar is cheap and many generics are available, finasteride users will quarter the 5 milligram tablet to get a 1.25 milligram dose, which is what I've been doing for many years now, and I think it works just fine. It's very effective, very cheap. I only spend about like $9 for a 4-month supply of finasteride, in fact, so really, really, really cheap for me. So anyways... There was a large trial that began back in the 1990s, which was conducted to assess whether finasteride could help prevent prostate cancer, and it was known as the Prostate Cancer Prevention Trial, also known as the PCPT trial, and it was published back in 2003 in the New England Journal of Medicine. So in the study, they enrolled men who were 55 years of age or older with normal prostate exams, as well as normal PSA levels. For those who don't know what PSA levels mean, it is an acronym for prostate specific antigen, which is a test to detect prostate cancers. So the higher it is, you're, the higher your chances of having prostate cancer is, essentially. So in other words, these were healthy men without any evidence of prostate cancer. So anyways, this study was a double-blinded, randomized controlled study, which was set to last seven years, which is good, because something like prostate cancer can really take several years to develop, if not longer. And anyways, the men were seen every year for, for a prostate exam, and they had their PSA levels checked uh, on a yearly basis or an annual basis. And at the end of the seven years, any man who hadn't already been diagnosed with prostate cancer was given a prostate biopsy to see if there was any cancer present. So the study enrolled 18,882 men, which is obviously a very good study, which isn't surprising since prostate cancer is, after all, one of the most well-researched diseases in the world, especially considering its prevalence. When they published the initial results, though, they wound up with complete data on 9,060 men after a seven-year follow-up, but this was an ongoing study, keep in mind. We'll get to the updated results later, but for now, let's focus on how things looked after seven years of daily finasteride use at five milligrams in this particular cohort. So the result the results look good for finasteride at first glance, at least, because we have an 18.4% uh, rate of prostate cancer in the finasteride treatment group versus 24.4% of men on the placebo treatment, which represents an overall 25% reduction in the risk of prostate cancer for those on finasteride. So if you look at this figure here, it shows that the risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer over time is lower for those who are on finasteride. So, so far, things are looking pretty damn good for Team Finasteride, and if I were as biased towards finasteride as some some people think I am, I would probably just conclude the video right now and say finasteride is the cure for prostate cancer, but sadly, it's not that simple. Here's where things start to get a little bit more complicated. So, when the researchers evaluated the prostate biopsies and looked at whatever prostate tumors they could find, they did what is called a Gleason score, which is a way to grade how malignant or serious a tumor is. Some tumors can be benign, meaning they don't cause any harm, so being able to assess whether a tumor is malignant or not is important when it comes to treating cancer answer, and that is where the Gleason score comes in. <laughs> So examining this figure here, it is a little hard to figure out, but the simplified version is, is that there were more tumors with a high Gleason score of 7 to 10 in the finasteride group, specifically in 6.4% of men on finasteride versus 5.1% of men on placebo. This was a small difference, but is nevertheless statistically significant, meaning it didn't seem to be due to chance. It's worth noting, though, that the rate of death from prostate cancer was exactly the same in both groups, meaning five men from each group died of prostate cancer. So the authors of the study concluded that finasteride was good at reducing the overall risk of prostate cancer by about 25%, but the fact that there were more higher grade cancers with finasteride caused some initial concern. Some experts felt that the increased detection of higher grade cancers might have been due to the fact that finasteride shrinks the prostate since it is easier to detect a tumor by chance in a smaller prostate than it is in a larger prostate. Some other researchers pointed out that the overall number of ch uh, cancers was lower with finasteride and that the mortality was the same as placebo, so people weren't dying more from malignant prostate cancer on finasteride compared to placebo. Nevertheless, 
The FDA took a strong look at this data and announced in 2011 that they had decided to put warning labels on both finasteride and dutasteride. Here's what the warning says. So, summing up what this warning is basically saying is that finasteride and dutasteride may increase the risk of developing high-grade prostate cancer. Now, I know on my oral minoxidil video, I did have a couple of people criticize me for mentioning that oral minoxidil has a black box warning label, and they said things like, Oh, but Kevin, didn't you know that finasteride also has a black box warning label? Use a hypocrite, bro! No, guys, this is not a black box warning like we see with oral minoxidil because black box warnings are literally enclosed in a black box and placed at the very top of a drug package insert. A black box warning label looks like this. Guess where I got this from? This is the black box warning for Lonatin, which is the trade name for oral minoxidil. Finasteride does not have this kind of warning. This is a warning reserved only for the most dangerous types of drugs on the market, and they shouldn't be confused with just a regular warning like you see with finasteride or with dutasteride. And before you ask, the answer is still no. I am not going to recommend oral minoxidil on my channel, so please stop asking about, asking about it. If you guys want to give yourself a pericardial effusion and kill yourself, then that is your business, but I insist that you leave me the hell out of it. Anyways, getting back on subject, the finasteride cancer warning was, of course, off-putting for a lot of people, which is understandable because, you know, prostate cancer is serious business, yo. But fortunately, we've got some good news, Jooms. In a letter published in 2019 in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is where the original study was published, I should mention, the very same authors of the same PCPT study reported some very optimistic follow-up data on the men in the original study they were able to contact the original 18,000 plus men enrolled in the study and follow up on them after over 18 years and found only 42 deaths from prostate cancer in the finasteride group compared to 56 deaths in the placebo group. So the original 25% reduction in cancer rates from the original study actually translated into a 25% lower mortality rate. So the concerns about cancer being more malignant on finasteride just didn't hold up. It was just a statistical flaw Luke, which can happen when conducting research, which is why follow-up data is so important, and this study is a perfect example of that. The researchers concluded, quote, the early concerns regarding an association between finasteride and an increased risk of high-grade prostate cancer have not been borne out, unquote. So in other words, there is no evidence that finasteride causes prostate cancer. And considering this was a double-blinded placebo controls trial involving over 18,000 men and conducted over the course of nearly two decades, I doubt we're going to get any data that's much better than this. This is pretty bulletproof as far as research goes. So the bottom line is that if you're still worried that finasteride causes as prostate cancer after a study this comprehensive confirming it doesn't, then you'd probably be a good candidate for the Propecia help forms at this point since obviously facts don't matter to you. There is clearly no reason to be concerned over an increased risk of prostate cancer if you take finasteride. If anything, the research shows that at the very worst, there is no increased risk, and if you want to take an optimistic look at it, it is possible it may even decrease the risk of prostate cancer a little bit. Remember, the finasteride group after over 18 years had a slightly lower mortality rate from prostate cancer compared to the placebo group. Also, I should stress that these men were on 5 milligrams of finasteride per day, which is 5 times higher than the standard dose for treating hair loss and many men do just fine even using smaller doses of finasteride for hair loss. You know, I get asked many times by people whether or not they can use finasteride every other day or take smaller doses, and you know, the answer is always yes. Those are all viable options. That is something you can work out with your doctor, but the underlying point of all this is that if 5 milligrams of finasteride doesn't show an increased risk of prostate cancer, then we sure as hell can bet that 1 milligram daily won't cause it either. So, Obviously, when it comes to anything involving the FDA, it is always going to be a very slow and arduous process, but I think the FDA should and probably will eventually remove the warning label about prostate cancer since there is no evidence-based data to back it up whatsoever. However, since 5-AR inhibiting drugs like finasteride and dutasteride are available as generics now, there is probably no real strong urgency for drug companies to petition the FDA to change the labeling because chances are they're likely not selling much of the drug now that it's available is just generic, and also it probably costs money to petition the FDA to change the label, which isn't worth it for a drug that's no longer very profitable at this point. And that is probably also the reason why you don't see finasteride or dutasteride advertised on TV anymore. But as a late gen Xer, I can tell you for sure that in the 90s, I remember seeing advertisements for a Propecia all the damn time. However, even though the evidence is clear that finasteride doesn't cause prostate cancer, I do think it is important to mention one potential concern for some patients. So, 
We've already mentioned PSA levels, which again stands for prostate specific antigen, and it is a screening test to detect prostate cancer. Finasteride lowers PSA levels by about 50%, so even though finasteride doesn't cause prostate cancer, it can potentially make it harder to detect if your doctor doesn't adjust, uh, adjust, adjust for this decrease in the PSA level. However, your doctor should probably already know you're on finasteride unless you're self-medicating, of course, in which case you're an idiot, but nevertheless, make sure your doctor knows you're on finasteride before getting a PSA blood test, just so your doctor can account for that variable. Routine PSA tests are already recommended for men over 50 years of age, and prostate cancer is very rare in men younger than that age anyways. But nevertheless, if you have some family history or feel you're at high risk, then make sure your doctor knows you are taking finasteride before you get your PSA tests. So, all this fear-mongering about finasteride causing prostate prostate cancer and all these other problems is why I really strongly encourage everybody to do their own research on the subject rather than listen to what a bunch of dickless fedora wearing pseudo intellectual bro scientists on hair loss forums say. I mean if you're losing your hair the absolute best thing you can do is stay away from the damn forums and just pop your finasteride like an aspirin and just get on with your day. And with that I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up but I do have more subjects to cover this week so expect another video again very soon. Thanks.